Whoa, that was very rock star. <laughs> yeah, that was. Um, what I wanted us to do uh, tonight was maybe starting from the very ABC of what film editing is, because I got the feeling that, you know, most people don't really know what a film editor does. What would you say? Oh, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I, I see myself maybe slightly different. I mean, I feel like I'm a composer who walked down yeah. a corridor and saw an editing room and went in it and thought it was quite nice there and stayed by mistake. <laughs> It's a sort of, you know, I kind of still feel I'm more a composer than an editor. I mean, I stopped writing music 10 years ago, but um, I had to make a choice between one and the other. But it means, I mean, I suppose it comes out, I can't stop that from coming out yeah. in the way that the films look a little bit. Um, you know, it's a collaboration, so I can't change everything, but it's like, a, as much as possible, I try and respond to the rhythm of things. And I guess I'm better known for a style that stops, you know, doesn't edit too much and um, allows the kind of editing to be quite an aggressive partner in the film. So, and, you know, Steve McQueen's work is a good... Uh, showcase for that because he tends to shoot, you know, in, in very few shots. He he hates the C word. Yeah. He, you know, he doesn't talk about coverage. Yeah. Did you think I meant another C word? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he uh, he he won't talk about coverage. And um, you know, as for him, you know, the ideal scenario is one shot. And the danger is sometimes, you know, you have to kind of be there on set and say, you know, uh, we're missing something or. You know, is there any way? And that ruin, really ruins everybody's day. But um, the idea is, you know, you hold on to a shot for a long time. The first film we did together, Hunger, has a 17 and a half minute long shot in it. I think something really strange happens when you see um, a shot like that, which is more akin, and maybe this is, you know, Steve McQueen's long, you know, uh, history with uh, art, mm -hmm. means that in a way what you're doing is you're putting a frame around something and... Cutting, you know, if you're conscious of it, it's a part of the storytelling process that reassures you and maybe guides you towards, you know, um, uh, uh, colouring a story. And television editing is quite active and quite busy and it'll show you everything about the space that people inhabit yeah. and then it'll bounce between people contentedly. You know, one of the earliest lessons I learned um, at the BBC, as it was when I was in the system, was um, not to cut you know, just not to cut. And um, the actual lesson, I was really lucky, I had a, the editor I worked with who was this very wonderful, uh, he'd been an arts documentary editor, Arden, and uh, he liked to drink at lunchtime, which was <laughs> great for me because somebody had to cut the film. <laughs> and so I would get like two or three hours while he, he would like hide behind the trim bin and uh, have a little kip. And I would trying my best to cut the sequence. And I had a scene which was a wide shot of three people in a pub, three old men in a pub. And it was a very, very funny scene. And the director had shot that and he'd also shot the close-ups for each individual actor. And I basically spent three hours, you know, working away, trying to kind of make every joke work and reactions to fit. And I was a pool of sweat at the end of the, uh, my time. And he sort of, re re you know came round from his, uh, from his little sleep and he had a look and he was rolling it backwards and forwards and he said, ah, it's, all, it's all very well, but let's have a look at the wide shot, put up the wide shot and we just watched the wide shot. He said, it's better. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, it was, it was better because it had all of the body language that I'd missed And it wasn't in your face telling you what to think all the time. It was just letting it, three of the best actors saying th some of the best lines that were written at the time in a really lovely shot in a pub with no movement, and it was magical. So, I don't know, I learned a lesson there, and in, in the shot we're talking about in Hunger, part of that, the success of that, I think, is also landscaping, what I refer to as landscaping, in that that conversation comes about... Uh, halfway through the film, after you've had a long build of tension and violence that escalates to a point of maximum tension where you have the most horrible thing happens to the guard, yeah. and then you are ready for somebody to talk. And in fact, we did everything we could to avoid um, any dialogue prior to that point. So that's, you're starved of 
dialogue and then you get some, a great big block of 21 minutes of dialogue and it says everything you need to say about the situation and about that person's thoughts. So I don't know, it's kind of, you know, by creating a, a hunger in a way for that. That's, sorry, that's a terrible, <laughs> terrible joke. Um, <laughs> But you create a demand for, for dialogue and then we really give it to you. I, I often feel that film editing nowadays is uh, quite often you, you, you'll hear about rhythm and pacing. Is there uh, some kind of arithmetics or mathematics to it? To it or is a recipe. A, a gut feeling, a recipe. Yeah, I want the recipe. <laughs> I, you know, it's like, um, I think it's partly observing that the brain, you know, the brain... You know, I mean, I saw Mad Max, uh, the recent Mad Max, and I, you know, I, afterwards I felt more intelligent than when I came into the cinema because it's so visually literate, that film. And actually everything's coming at you. I think the average length of shot is about one and a half, two seconds. It's a very, very quick pace. And that works. That shtick works for that, that film, you know. It was very carefully shot to, to work like that. It, you know, I've been involved in slower films, But it's not necessarily slow. It's a question of managing time versus yeah. time and tension. It's not just being slow. It's not like there's a science to it, but I'm just, I think the brain enjoys those games. And, you know, uh, Shame, for example, is a very good example of that in Shame. We had a scene where uh, Brandon, Michael Fassbender's character, takes his boss to see his, sing, his sister sing. Mm. And she sings, uh, the boss starts flirting with the sister and there's a very awkward moment where it's clearly going places. And then you cut straight to the back of the taxi and his boss has got his tongue down her throat. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like in, a, in one twenty-fourth of a second, we go from flirtation to uh, yeah. the act. And uh, Brandon's face is, sells that. There was a whole scene in the middle where they came out and it was a beautiful scene. And... Uh, You know, they walked, They came out of the Standard Hotel and there was an ice rink and there was, you know, it was very Jules Gym and they held a cam, uh, a, you know, a cab and Steve was very proud of it and I just said, look, one time, will you let, just let me show you something? And I just cut the whole scene out and we let Ford and he, he never asked to see that scene again. It was, you know, because the brain is so rewarded when you know where something's going, where there's a tension, to satisfy that with a sharp clip seems to me kind of one of the most fun things we can do. When did you start working with, uh, with Steve McQueen? D did you know knew him prior to, uh, to working on uh, Unger? We met uh, on uh, interview for the job, but it turned out that we had um, a lot in common because we both came from the same place in London, which is Ealing, which is West London. And uh, I was about a mile north of Ealing Studios and he was about a mile south. So um, we had the same library and we had the same, you know, cinema and the same, you know, terrible pubs. And uh, so we had a lot in common. And um, I think things like the library and um, the doc arts documentaries on BBC were both a big common ground that we sort of, you know, found our way away from a suburban mindset with, with that. There's something fascinating for me about Steve's film. Is they're all about someone being trapped, trapped in time maybe, but trapped in your own ideology in the case of Hunger. And there's something fascinating about 12 Years Slave. It's the first film where he takes it quite literally. We see basically someone being a slave, but that's also the first film where we see uh, a free man, basically, because Solomon is free before he, he, he gets to be a, a slave. So how you decided that the film wasn't going to be uh, this whole linear thing, exactly like the book was, and how you started working on time in 12 Years a Slave and this very peculiar pacing. That's, um, uh, that's interesting. I mean, basically, the, the story as it was uh, written in the book and in the screenplay and as shot, it started with Solomon in, you know, in the northern part of the country, a free man with his wife, and his wife goes off on a, on a, uh, on a work trip, leaving him behind. He picks up a job. He goes with some... Um, uh, magicians and he ends up in Washington and then he wakes up one morning in chains and then he follows the story one thing after the other. And, um, and I think it was in response to, you know, the viewing, the screening process is like, to me, is like supremely important is you're constantly changing the cut. It's an opportunity to measure it on people and there's one thing to intellectually think that something's working but when you're sitting next to somebody and it isn't, you sort of feel it 
you know, chemically. So, uh, and I think after some screenings about seven or eight weeks into the cut, we realized that we needed to get to Louisiana faster. And, you know, if you can step back from a two-hour movie and just say, okay, if I was to tell somebody at, um, at a party what I'm working on and tell the story of Solomon, how long does it take to tell the story of how, how he is abducted? And it's, it's not very long. I mean, it really it takes a couple of cents. The mechanics is very simple. So it was realizing that and then realizing that some of these things worked really well in the rear view mirror. But it was born out of fear and, and, uh, and you know, worry that we weren't getting on with the story fast enough. I read that you do this very lo-fi thing that doing post-it, you have this little index card where you write a few words about what every scene must be or, or, or might be. So oh, it's like it's my way of learning the script actually before they start. It's like you have to kind of know the script. You have to also refer to the script and go, okay, well, that's a shot of Solomon lying on his back and the previous shot, in the previous sequence, he's been whipped. So he's, you know, I'm looking out for him looking uncomfortable. I'll look in the dailies for something that, you know, keeps continuity. It's a simple thing. But also, I think it helps sometimes to, if you're restructuring, is just to pick up a post-it note and move it around a wall is a lot better than getting bogged down in the detail, you know, technical detail of how do I cut from this shot to yeah. that shot? Oh, I've got two similar shots, they don't cut together. It, you know, it's not the right way to approach big yeah. structural changes. So, I don't know, it's just a technique. It looks good as well. <laughs> <laughs> it looks great. Uh, I heard you say that you need not to be on set too much. You need not to be too friendly with, with, with everyone. Because in the end, a film editor as friendly as you are, doesn't have that friendly of a job because sometimes, you know, this has to stop. The, the acting has to stop. The film and the shooting has to stop. Everything has to stop and has to be, uh, have to be cut. I, you have to have a heart of stone as well. Yeah. And, you know, you have to serve the story. And it's like, I learned a really big lesson because I went on set one time and it was this beautiful, um, they were doing an establishing shot on a Welsh hillside and there was a crane shot, it was a very expensive shot, and they had a load of cars coming up a hill, and it was uh, the bunting and a big tent, and it was going to be a wedding scene. And then the next scene, you cut inside, and you have the best man speech. And uh, I went on set, and there was a lady who'd been up a ladder all night, and she'd been stapling uh, plastic flowers on the side of this cottage. And, and she was just like, obviously, had been up there all, on the ladder all night. And, and then when it came to the cart, and it was like, you just want to go straight to the speech, you know? <laughs> and I just thought about that lady and her, her toil. And it's really, you know, I couldn't face her in the, in the cast and crew. So I, you know, I sort of vowed that it was really good to keep a distance. And uh, yeah, so I didn't go on set. One thing that fascinated me, I think Steve McQueen said that about you, Michael Fassbender, and uh, Sean Bobbitt, that you, you were like the Rolling Stones. So <laughs> Can I you, be Charlie you, you Watts? So things. long as I'm Charlie yeah. Watts, I'm happy. Oh, you definitely are. <laughs> uh, so you do t things on the side, but you, you always get, a, get together uh, in, in the end. So are you getting together anytime soon? I um, I did a short film with him last year. I mean, I'm on a I'm on a roll with Denny at the moment, and uh, and Steve was on the gap and he was doing some other projects. So it was a good time, you know. But I did a short art film for Venice Biennale called Ashes, which is very strange, um, a really strange thing because I'd never done any of his short films. So it was kind of I was really coming over to his side of the fence, if you like, and um, so. In, in some way, I was wondering, did those films allow you to, to try something else than Steve McQueen's film on, on action or pacing? Well, you know, I mean, I've been evolving, you know, in what I call cheating, you know. Yeah. I'm not really somebody who expects the thing to stay the same. If it doesn't stay the same, then I'm not really doing my job, and it feels like there's so many improvements, and you, you can respond to how people are taking the story. You know, in 12 years, we did so many things that shaped... Um, you know, just to get inside Solomon's head sometimes yeah. because he is, doesn't always, he has nobody to tell what he's thinking. You can't always, you know, he's not verbalizing what he's thinking. So, you know, you have to kind of devise these clever ways of, of uh, getting inside his head. So I think the evolution 
you ask about those films, but uh, I think of a film like The Escapist, which yeah. I did, which was, you know, the first film where we really revised, did a total redraft of the film in the cut. And that I really was emboldened by that. I'm not sure it was... 100% successful, yeah. if I'm honest, but it, it was like, it, it set me on the path of saying, okay, let's start moving stuff around and see what we can shake, you know. And just treating the whole thing as material and keeping the... I had this um, real uh, breakthrough moment watching a film about Picasso. Yeah. It's such a strange thing, but I, there's a film called The Mystery of Picasso, which I'd recommend to anybody. It's very meditative. The really inspirational thing is that at one point he did this picture with one stroke and it's a chicken. And you look at it and you go, oh my God, you know, you know with one stroke he makes a, a Picasso chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and you could sell it right tomorrow, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, I recognise uh, uh, an anxiety in editors not to change things, you know, because I've done my job, you know, I cut the thing the way I wanted to, and then you try and protect it from the invasion of everybody else and everybody's thoughts. And with Picasso, in Picasso's case, he takes up his, his paintbrush and he does a second stroke and you're going, no, <laughs> don't change it, it's a perfect Picasso chicken. And then he does a squiggle and he turns it into a centurion's helmet. And it's better than a chicken <laughs> and you kind of go that was my inspiration of saying you know just keep the clay moist and keep going until it's it's better and it does the job and maybe in a film maybe a chicken isn't the right thing you know maybe you need a centurion you have to kind of maul the material to fit what you need in the story anyway <laughs> thank you <That> was nice. <laughs>